Hi, this is Greg Boyson with Inside Personal Growth, and I am joining me uh, from South Bend, Indiana, is Linda, and I want you to pronounce your own last name because I would probably mess this up and I should have asked you before we got on, but say it for us. It's Warziniak. Warziniak. And for all of those who are listening, it's spelled W-A-W-R-Z-Y-N-I-A-K. And the reality is you probably were good that I asked you how to say Warzeniak. Um, and if you want to learn more about Linda and her book, we're going to be talking about the million dollar adjustments. I'd like for you to go to majorleagueconsulting.com. Uh, there you can learn more about Linda. You can learn more about her consulting. Uh, and we will put a link to the book, uh, Miller, Million Dollar Adjustments. Well, Linda, I'm going to let our listeners know uh, something about you. Uh, Linda is developed the Million Dollar Adjustment Program. Developing people inside of a corporate environment is an important activity because it's preparing them for uh, specific skills they need to do their job well. Unlike regular schooling, corporate education is more focused on growth and improvement in a real world setting. The learning is immediately executable in a day-to-day -day tasks. This means that people are in a consistent state of adjustment of applying what they know to what they don't know, as well as what they are in the middle of learning. So that's the title of her book, Million Dollar Adjustment. And she has spent much of her career, and I'm going to let her tell that story, working with Major League Baseball players. And for those of you who are joining us on Zoom, you get to see the glove, the ball, and the American flag, and a beautiful young lady speaking wow. with us. So um, let's start this podcast off with this. You know, Linda, set the stage for the interview. Give the listeners a little context um, for your book. Uh, tell the listeners a little about yourself and really what has inspired you to want to write million dollar adjustment. Because I, I think most listeners could probably figure out that, you know, if a batter gets up to bat, there's a certain percentage of them. If they just adjust their swing a little bit, they're going to hit more home runs, right? Because that's been something that's been done. But you're actually kind of informing them how to go through that process. So tell us more about you and the book. Okay, well, first of all, thank you, Greg, for having me. Um, I really appreciate this time and your interest in, in my work. Um, so I started totally by accident in baseball. I obviously did not play Major League Baseball, um, but I got involved through the um, education of international players. At the time, uh, Major League Baseball was bringing a lot of young men in from other countries, and the, they realized right away that the acculturation process was not easy, and so they needed some help. Um, so they looked to the outside and found some people who not necessarily were had baseball background, but did have an education background and could teach. So I started kind of that way, teaching some, some baseball players, started out with like seven guys, um, realized right away there was no system, there was no infrastructure, no curriculum. Um, and so I went on the process of developing it. And after a couple of years, just working with a few guys, um, I was invited to spring training, which was a big deal. So I went to spring training in Arizona, didn't know what it really was. I had no idea. Walked into it, felt like a real, you know, fish out of water, but um, walked around and met a lot of people, really nice people. And a coach came up to me at the time and, you know, he introduced himself, said he really appreciated what I was doing. And so I asked him what he did. And he told me he was a former league, big league player. And now this was his first coaching job. And I was kind of surprised. Um, so I just said, well, what, what's been the biggest, you know, thing, the lesson that you've learned in baseball since you've been at the major league level and now you're a coach? And um, what he said really surprised me. He said it was just basic, that life was about patience and adjustments. And I did not expect him to say that, but it, it was so simple and yet so profound. And at the time I thought, okay, hmm, that's interesting. And I sort of tucked that away. But then as I went through baseball and listened to meetings, that word adjustment just kept coming up over and over and over again. And finally I said, this is the key to success in this sport. This is the key to who makes it to the big leagues and who doesn't. So I need to figure out what this means. And so I went on this journey 
um, of unraveling that word and really getting to the basic, to, to the understanding of what makes somebody have this, how does someone have it, who has it, and what quantities, what makes it, what makes, what are the elements of this, of this word adjustment? Um, well, it's interesting when you say that, you know, because whether you're an airline pilot or you're somebody trekking a mountain, um, adjustment is a, is a very important thing, right? So if you're just off a small degree and you're headed toward Hawaii, and I know you've heard this story, you're literally going to miss the islands completely. Um, and it's those minor adjustments that, believe it or not, now the planes, the computers are making, the pilots aren't making, but the computers are. Um, and in your case, it's these minor adjustments that you're making. Um, and to kind of be at peace, I'd say, a little bit more with every adjustment you make and then allow it to become more of a habit. Um, now, in your chapter entitled Face to Face with Failure, you mentioned that adjustment is one of the most treasured and powerful words that you could have in our vocabulary. Um, can you speak with our listeners about the importance of introducing adjustments in our lives, not just the baseball players, but in our lives? Um, and should the introduction be done in a step-by-step -step process or should it be all at once? Oh, that's a great question. Um, well, adjustment is about grace and growth, also performance and peace. So basically it's the small things that we do to get us closer to our goal. And if you look at it that way, it frees us from being perfectionists and feeling that we have to have it all figured out right now. And I think that's what a lot of people feel. They, they put a lot of pressure on themselves to have it all figured out. And they don't realize that adjustments are expected and they are important. And so basically um, we will fail we will fail at times and we need to know how to navigate that failure. How do we give ourselves grace and grow through that so that we can then perform? Once we know how to do that, we have peace. So that's really why it's such a, like such a powerful word in our vocabulary. And each person will handle that a little differently, whether it's step by step or all at once. It kind of depends on what kind of adjuster you are. Well, I think, um... You know, one of the statements, I've done a lot of uh, interviews on spirituality because this podcast genre is personal growth, business, wellness, and spirituality. Those are all the books that come across my path. And I think one of the statements that uh, Ram Das said, he was on the show, and uh, many of my listeners know he is, but it's, it's be here now. You know, the more present you are right now in the moment, the more you're going to learn. And the more you're going to realize that you can't blame yourself for something that happened yesterday and you can't berate yourself for it. And at the same time, you don't know what tomorrow brings. So the, you can get this tremendous focus by staying here now and you can make those adjustments to have a better life by s staying in this moment. And I think that's important. Yeah. And in chapter two, you defined adjustment as a type of modification in how we do things built on five key elements uh, that you state, the five key elements work together in different ways, informing and inspiring individual behavior. So this is a behavior change uh, when it comes to new situations. So I'm throwing something new, I have to adjust, right? Uh, whether it's a curveball, and I never saw the curveball coming, uh, and attempts at the old ones. Can you briefly discuss the five elements of adjustment to the listeners and how this would help them improve their lives, whether it's baseball or it's work or it's family or it's home. Absolutely. I think in, um, you know, we, we started to test, we created a test so that we would actually have data-driven information. And it's from this data that we defined and found these five elements. So I'm telling you, we define these based on what we saw in our testing. So the first one is beliefs. Um, Beliefs, some people don't think you can test, but in a weird way, it's based on subjective probability, meaning that if you didn't succeed at something in the past, you probably won't think that you can uh, succeed at it in the future. So that's your own subjectivity and your own probability. So, um, and it works the other way too. So 
beliefs definitely play a part in our adjustment, um, how we make adjustments. Can I ask you a question real quick there? Not to, not to throw you off, because that's the first one, beliefs. <laughs> um, but, you know, the subconscious mind is so powerful, yet people hardly ever think about reprogramming it. Mm -hmm. But within that subconscious mind are those beliefs about what we become. What would you tell people about, you know, because baseball players in particular, coming from all nationalities, all walks of lives, making it to the big times, right? right? And yet they're carrying these beliefs about themselves as somebody maybe who was poor, came from this area, worked their way up to get where they are. And yeah. those beliefs are very challenging to get rid of. And then they're thrust into this limelight situation. And a lot of them have a lot of problems adjusting. That's very true. Yeah. So what would you tell about... I mean, if you were telling a baseball player to adjust his beliefs and his subconscious, how would you recommend them kind of going about it? One thing that we have found is that the belief element um, really ties in with one other element. It can be one or two. So when you make an adjustment or when you help them see the other elements, then suddenly through the testing, then suddenly they say, oh, I see that. I think I can do that. Or, oh, you know, when you, when you, re you have to explain to them the belief is part of it and you have to understand where their subjective probability is. This is exactly why John Lester has the yips at times. He can't throw to first base. And that is a subjective probability that he has in his mind. Probably looked at his stats and went, mm, I don't think I can really do that. I'm not going to risk it. So suddenly you know, we carry these things around. Do we risk or do we not risk based on our own beliefs? So once we start teaching some of the other elements, then that one starts to open up. So let me, the, I, well, one of them that we see has a huge immediate impact is internal timing. That's the other belief, or I'm sorry, the other element. That element is basically how we see time and it has a lot to do with our central nervous system. Um, it's not chronological time. It's our own internal timing. And one way that we um, kind of help people see this or understand this is through a very simple demonstration. So I, I can show you if you're interested. Does it require that I uh, stand up? No, you don't have to stand up at all. Okay. All you have to do is tell me stop and start. That's all. So I'm going to ask you to, I'm going to start. Um, when you say start, I'm going to hit my stopwatch and when you think four seconds has passed just say stop okay start stop okay so that was 1.59 half not even half <laughs> right so so your internal timing runs faster um and so that's all it is it's just how do we how do we what is our internal timing like and so sometimes when we're in the middle of a task that comes into play so much, especially during a failure or uncertainty or anything else. We just have this that we have. Some people run fast, some people run slow, some people run just at the same. It's very interesting once you see it. So if you have, um, so, so when people are looking at their beliefs, we always look at their timing because that definitely impacts their belief system. Um, the third so how, is, would, would, how would me reacting so quickly affect my belief system? This is a great learning uh, experience for the listeners. So if you are Because I'm faster. Fast, yeah, I'm yeah, running faster. You will, probably, you will probably form your beliefs quicker, um, one way or the other. You and don't I throw them have, away faster too? Could be, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So that's usually you're processing quicker, quick, sorry, quicker. And so because of that, you're going to determine um, your subjective probability a lot faster. But I think beliefs that are not serving one, right? We carry around beliefs that don't serve us. Yeah, um, that can be a good thing th too. Those are ones to get rid of or adjust as quickly as possible. You talk about million dollar adjustment. The million dollar adjustment is getting rid of beliefs that are not serving you. Right. And I think when you... Um, when you are quicker, when you, when you have quicker internal timing, it takes you a little bit more to see whether or not that's going to shift or not. Um, so, okay, so that's number two. We've gotten there. We have three more to go. <laughs> um, 
I'll make these quick. The third one is strategic action, which can be either offensive or defensive. All that means is we're going to initiate it or someone else is going to initiate it. Okay. So um, the fourth one is information synthesis. It's a real nerdy way of saying how much do we see in our environment and how can we use that to make a better adjustment. And the last does that one, have to do with the reticular activating system? Yes, actually it does. That's what I thought. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's cool that you know that. <laughs> um, and then the fifth one is knowledge. So how do we, um, how do we actually, what do we need to know? What do we know and what do we need to know in order to make an adjustment? Very good. So and I think, that, I think for our listeners that, you know, this podcast, if all they did was learn those five steps, they could really make the adjustments. And it's Absolutely. so, and, and by the way, I just need to say this about you. She distilled it down into something so simple. It doesn't have to be that complicated. So if you look at those steps, will you repeat those steps, please, quickly Absolutely. for the listeners? Beliefs, internal timing, strategic actions, information synthesis, and knowledge. It's beautiful. It's, uh, it's wonderful. Now, in your chapter three, you speak about COVID-19 pandemic and the adjustments that were brought about and the new normal. And now as of this morning, uh, Pfizer has a pill that's gonna be 89% uh, effective at uh, preventing death, right? So now we're starting seeing a huge waning. I've been listening to it this morning. Big news, huge yeah. news. Um, so in different aspects like technology, food, music, transportation, and more, you also speak about the relation of adjustment patterns in the transformation that happened, right, as a result of COVID. And it's not that we're still not dealing with it. Hopefully, we won't be dealing with it at all much longer. What are the benefits of knowing your adjustment patterns? Um, and as you say, kind of at the height of COVID-19. You know, some of this stuff is going to start to shift now. And I think we were all thinking, oh, we're in this for years. Well, maybe we won't be, which would be good. <laughs> yes, would be good. People will get to go back to baseball games and sit in stands and have a beer and a hot dog and enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, that would be nice. I think everyone's looking forward to that. Yeah. Um, well, you know, COVID-19 is a big shift in, in, in like we talk about, I do, I do mention like disruptors and drivers. And I would say that it was kind of a disruptor and it's also been a driver. So people um, are who are trying to make sense of it all, this is where you, knowing your adjustment pattern makes a big difference. So let me give you an example. If you are a maverick, so based on our test and how people scored, we ran, we built lots of algorithms and we looked at a lot of different things and we came up with seven basic patterns. Um, there are more and there are nuances, but overall there are seven. And then we gave them some fun baseball names because why not? We're in baseball. So the Maverick is someone who basically um, is not afraid. They, they, they're they very driven to succeed, not afraid to succeed. But if there's a slight failure or a huge uncertainty in the road, they might have some doubt. And that might creep into the way they adjust to the situation um, and it might impact their performance. So you throw the curveball of COVID-19 to a maverick. And at first they're gonna say, oh yeah, that's no, you know, that's fine. I'm gonna work through that. We're gonna get through that. That's no big deal, blah, blah, we move forward. But then maybe something happens where they see like hospital numbers or they have someone they know who who doesn't you know, do well through it and suddenly there's doubt or maybe they, they get it, who knows? And so now that can affect the way they're gonna make adjustments going forward. So it has a lot to do with adjustment pattern. Whereas maybe a steady eddy is gonna say, well, I'm just gonna do it the way I always do it. Um, I've always kind of worked through it this way and I'm just gonna work through to the same thing this way. Um, so it's very fascinating when you look at the seven different types of patterns and how people have responded to this, it really follows the same, um, the same path and the same patterns. So, Well, people can take this uh, assessment at your website and is it, it's at no cost? They want to do the assessment or am I right or am I wrong? In the well, book. Well, both. So in the book, there's actually a free, inside the book, there's a, it's called an audit. It's a, it's a derivative of the one we do in Major League Baseball. 
Okay. And the reason not the one we do in baseball is because this is a text and, and the one we do is not a pencil paper based test. So um, this is as close as you're going to get to the actual test. If you want to take the actual test, then you have to schedule for it on the website. It's a it's a it's a it's the one that's used inside the draft in Major League Baseball. So there is a cost with it. Yes. OK. And what is the cost if my listeners want to do that? Um, currently, the cost is one twenty five. So OK. Affordable. Yeah. Very affordable. I mean, so you can go to her website and contact her and then you basically can take the test or you can buy the book for whatever it's being sold at at Amazon and take the test yourself in the back of the book. So if you're going to do it, the book's probably going to be a lot cheaper. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course. You know, you know, it, it's it's really interesting to see how you've related this to baseball and how, um, you know, our performance is affected by being resistant to adjustment. Right. Uh, and you get a lot of people that are resistant. And I don't know if you figured out I was a maverick because you kept talking about a maverick. I've always been a maverick. Um, but I'm also the kind of person that probably lets stuff drop off quicker and is not as affected by it because I've moved forward. I've kind of been a serial entrepreneur. And uh, it doesn't mean it doesn't affect you psychologically, but you're constantly making adjustments, Absolutely. okay? And in chapter four, entitled Your Personal Adjustment Tendencies, you share the adjustment awareness audit is a great tool, which is what you were just talking about, uh, to help people understand their performance adjustment tendencies uh, and to make their plan to the next move. Speak with us, if you would, um, and if there's any more you want to add than what you've already said about the the uh, the test, you know, if I take this test and I do, and I do it out of the book, what's it going to do for me? What should I pay attention to? Um, and if I was listening right now and I wanted to spend $125, why would I spend the $125 to go get the test? The difference really is um, the audit tool gives you a close idea of your tendencies. It's based on um, looking at the different patterns and how this one could be closest to the seven. However, if you have a nuance or you have something, sometimes people see that there could be one or two different um, types, so they're not exactly sure, then at that point they might want to go and take the actual test and maybe get a little bit more breakdown and a little bit more information on, okay, this is the actually where I'm at. Now, the book also talks about that you can train it, your adjustment pattern for optimization. So if you're not 100% sure that you're here or here, you might, and you have something important that you're training for, um, you might wanna go the next step. If you're just doing it for general information, it probably won't matter. But it really depends on your goals and how fast you're trying to get to a specific goal and how big that goal is. So maybe it does matter just depending on those things. You've got a chapter about making better adjustments. We've talked about adjustments. Now we're talking about better adjustments. And obviously you can continue to fine tune. It's like a dial on the radio. You know, we say there's static and how you get the static out. Now, I might be talking about the olden days, but the reality is, is that this is like fine tuning, fine tuning, fine tuning. Uh, it's like the adjustment you make to a piano when it's in tune, you know when it's in tune and when it's out of tune. And you state that our internal clocks shapes the way we perceive time, rhythm, uh, coordination, um, and is largely controlled by the brain's pulses carried by the nervous system. Totally got it. And the patterns of behavior we developed over time. So we're carrying stuff that's happened and we either chose to keep that belief or that set something up because there's people that have PTSD um, you know, you get PTSD as a result from having a traumatic something happen, and then it keeps replaying because the wiring and firing in the brain is going, something triggers it, and boom, it's there, right? What advice do you give our listeners about controlling our internal clock for better focus? So um, I'm working with a, several young men right now, but... Um, they, we see a lot of the times that we either overthink something or we underthink it. And when you combine that with an action, it can be a huge success or a huge failure, or maybe it's not as great as what you want it to be. So um, our brains can either help us or hinder us in the process of what we're trying to do. So by focusing on time, see, we're trained as a society to focus so much on 
um, data information, um, just that we have overload and that's what we're focused on. But when you kind of shift and start telling people, focus a little bit more on your time, that's new because we're saying, what, wait a minute, what do you mean? Yeah, that is going to impact how you use this data, how you use this information, whatever it is that, whatever visual information or inputs that you're getting, when you start focusing on time versus the amount of information, suddenly there's an execution difference. Mm -hmm. And that's a difference between leadership and many other things, goal set, you know, reaching goals, um, succeeding in what you're doing because time, we don't, we have learned how to drown out time. And unfortunately that is to our detriment because it really does, there's a beat to how we do things things, a rhythm to how we do things. And we don't know it anymore. We've lost touch with it. Um, when you gain it back, suddenly this whole thing opens up. I, I see it all the time when I work with people. It's like so fun to watch <laughs> the change because suddenly they go, oh, now I get it. Now I need to focus on my timing as I do this. And suddenly- Yeah. It's like, they always say that it's in the timing, right? Yeah. And it's interesting story because there's a duality about time. Yeah. There's, uh, you know, I, I think you bringing up the point to be focused on time is important. And here's a story that I think, a little story that would, that kind of, it correlates. Yeah. So these Buddhist monks used to come and I went to these meditation retreats and they'd ask them, well, what is it that you want? Because they'd come over from uh, Asia and literally, they would say, well, we would like to get a watch, a watch, you know, a watch. And you're like, you guys yeah. never have had watches. Why is it that you want a watch? Well, they heard that there were watches here in the U.S. And they have a skeleton at the end of the bed with it they sleep in. And then they have a watch. And they said, well, why do you want a watch? Because you guys aren't so focused on time. And they'll go, that's not true. We're focused on how much time we have left. Interesting. That's and I was, I it was, it's like the clock is ticking and it's like, we don't have much time left. So we've got to get these things done, right? <laughs> so, you know, I thought, and I was just thinking about that because it popped in my head when you said the timing. And I'm thinking, here I am at this meditation retreat, these Buddhist monks, Tapas monks, and they're saying, I want to get a watch. And you're like, what do you want to watch for? So I can keep track of the time, not the time that's passed, the amount of time I have left. Yeah, that's fascinating. No? <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. It is. <laughs> I didn't know anything like that. That's actually quite an interesting story because I had always pictured them as more present-minded, but that almost shows them more future-minded, right? Well, they're, they're, they're focused on actually the watch is a reminder. They use it as a, not so much they wear it. They actually hang it on the bedpost. It's a reminder. It's a symbol of what is left. You know, what, what did we do today and how much time is left? Not what passed. Right. You know, right. it wasn't about, oh, well, eight hours has gone by today, blah, 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 blah. It's like, okay, it's reminding them of the future. It's um, so true. That, yeah. That's right. Well, we don't, none of us really know how much time we have, no. but it's part of the point, right? That yeah. you have to make the best of the moment that you have. And most of us are looking at a timepiece. I know I've had this Apple watch for a long time and you, it's a timepiece. Yeah. And you say, well, so what is it? That clock that's over there is reminding me of how much time has transpired, not how much time always is left. That's true. That's true. Because we're it's looking funny. at the past saying, well, it's 1035 right now. And Linda and I have been on this call for 35 minutes, right? Hypothetically. But, you know, it, if you think about it in reverse, it's, it's really quite, there, there's quite a um, duality when you start looking at time. And I think your part about focusing on that internal clock is so important. Um, yeah. If you would mentioned that we'd had over 10 years of research, you said, and testing in this, and trials and errors. And can you share the listeners uh, the best piece of advice given to you while you were writing the book? Because you did all this research, right? 10 okay. years of research, putting all this stuff together, then putting it in this book, and then conveying this message through this book. 
So what did you learn? You know, I was told that um, to keep it general enough so that you can take the what you've learned in research and anybody can use it. Um, and that's what I really attended to do. It, it isn't that easy, to be honest, to do that. So I've had to really think through and write and kind of rewrite um, how, how can I make this so that it is general enough, but you can see that it's backed by a lot of research and data. So that's really, that was really um, a challenge for me, but that was the advice I was given. And I think it's great advice because there's only a small portion of the population that really wants to know this in super big detail. Most of us just want our lives to be, um, to move in a positive direction and to be fulfilling um, and to do things for others. So how can we do that? Well, we all need to know how to make better adjustments. So that, that is what my goal was. And I thought that was a great piece of advice. Give as much backing that makes, you know, makes, makes people understand the, the basics, but make it general enough for everybody. So hopefully I've done that. You have, and I think, you Thank know, you. that um, for our listeners, adjustments is a word that's probably overlooked. You know, when you look at this book, The Million Dollar Adjustment, it's like, it, it, you're like looking at it going in the title. What is the million dollar adjustment, right? right. And in, even if you took the, t- the million dollar part out of it, yeah, and you just said life adjustments, oh, yeah. it, it, you know, it has a, a significant meaning for those that are going like, what are adjustments? Because we're adjusting every day. Something's changing. We're we're moving with what needs to be adjusted, right? So I like not linear, that's for sure. Yeah, totally not linear. Totally no. not. Now you tell a story, a heartfelt story in the book, uh, about Jordan and um and and Matt and her husband, yes, yeah. working through intense grief when they lost two pregnancies back to back. Um, what did this experience teach you about life adjustments as you state in the book? Because those are the adjustments we're all dealing with every day, whether it's one pregnancy, two pregnancies, it's somebody who gets sick in our life, it's a child who needs care, it's somebody with PTSD, it doesn't matter when, somebody who lost all their finances, uh, whatever. Those things are happening all around us all day. And what did that teach you? This, this, uh, that both pregnancies ended in termination. Well, first of all, it was such a difficult time, but I, I, um, I think the biggest thing it taught me was, and I had never experienced that personally. So I, I think any, any woman who's ever experienced pregnancy loss is a rock star. Um, to watch your child lose their child is heart wrenching as a parent, and I don't wish that on anybody. And to and for anyone else that has ever been through that experience, they do it so low. It's they're so lonely in that there isn't a lot of support. So um, I would like to say that I think any woman that's ever been through that is a rock star because it is definitely not easy. Um, so. Luckily, I had tested my daughter because when I was doing the test, the research of all this, I tested my whole family and everybody who I could get my hands on um, just for validation. And I found out that my daughter is also a maverick. Um, And so because of that, I knew that um, when, see her loss, she looked at, there's, there was multiple layers of loss. And sometimes um, we just, as, as it comes, we go, that's what happened. But in her case, she also saw it as failure. Um, and so I could, I could understand that because I understand failure very well um, because baseball is a game of failure. And so for me, I tapped into, you know, how to help her besides being there, crying with her, um, loving on her and, and her husband. There were other things too. And that was that if she's a maverick, then um, that means that you know, she, she talked about failure once she could start talking about it. She felt like a failure. Again, subjective probability. It wasn't just one loss. Now it was two losses. Well, that's how it's going to be probably forever, right? There was this whole subjective probability thing happening. Um, and so really working through that and I, and, and her timing basically stopped and she's a very high energy person, um, but her timing really stopped. 
she was heartbroken. And that's what loss and all that can do. So we have to start with the belief system and the, and the timing. In those situations, we have to work on that. So for her, I told her just do one normal thing a day, just one normal thing a day, yeah. because we have to get that timing going again, you know? Um, well, losing a child uh, through childbirth like that, not once, twice, um, mm -hmm. is devastating. But for both the father and the mother, uh, quite a depressing situation. Depressing, meaning, you know, you see many women fall into deep depression. Uh -huh. um, and whether it's counseling or some of the best thing that could be done is obviously getting them, because I think they stop, just like what you said is getting them moving, right? Exactly. Whether it's yoga or it's running or it's whatever it is. The, when the body's in motion like that, especially for a maverick, and I can speak highly to that, um, your sense of creativity starts again. And a child is actually created as a result of creativity. It's a beautiful union uh, to come together and create a child and, and basically uh, have that creativity, right? And so, you know, um, I know it because I've been there. I've been through those bouts being a maverick. So I know what it's like. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say, if anything, there's one thing to keep focused on is how do you highly charge somebody like that to stay in the creative zone? Um, whether it's a creative outlet through writing, painting, jogging, exercising, doesn't matter what it is, but find the avenues and the outlets um, because it then takes your mind off of the loss. Um, yeah, and that's, you know, we talk about that, we, that's that chapter, um, that we talk about a story when we're talking about joy, because we have to find joy in moments of loss. And it's not easy to do because you don't feel joyful at all. Cause joy, right. um, you know, but joy can reset your timing also. Um, and we need to be understanding joy. So I talk about that a lot because we need that for, for our timing. It really keeps our timing in balance. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, through this pandemic, you were talking about it uh, earlier on. You know, I lost two brothers, not to COVID, this last year, and I lost two very good friends. And, you know, there's nothing like finitude to give you a perspective about being here now and being focused. Right. Uh, and whatever it is you're trying to accomplish. So your book really points out some very important points that people not only need to be reminded of because I think they easily forget um, and to apply those steps and those steps that you have are so valid. So Linda, if you were to leave the all listeners with three key takeaways from our book, uh, your book, I should say, <laughs> and I didn't write the book, <laughs> I said our book, um, what would they be and how can you tell them to apply them? What, what advice would you give what teaching advice would you give about applying them? Um, the first one is I think that life is always going to throw you a curveball. So you just better prepare for it now. Um, why wait until you, the curveball is right in front of your face? Um, okay. So start preparing, practice through the adjustment processes and prepare so you can have peace when that comes. Um, the second one is that um, no matter what kind of adjuster you are, or maybe you find out that you are through this book, you can improve it and um, you can have joy and peace. So um, there's always ways to, to uh, train that adjustment skill set, And whether that's in you or someone else, it's something we should always be trying to do. Um, and I think the last one is that it's okay to say no to adjustments that you don't feel are right for you. And I talk about that in the chapters or in the book too, because sometimes we, come up against a change or something that we, um, an uncertainty that we aren't okay with. So for whatever reason, and those are talked about in the book, the five Fs. So just if that's, if that happens, sometimes we have to draw the line on adjustment and that's okay. Well, you've summarized it very well. And I think for our listeners, uh, just to let them know, I want to repeat this again, go to majorleagueconsulting.com to learn more about Linda and the book. Uh, there will be a link to the book on Amazon. So you obviously can get the Kindle version or the paperback version of the book. Um, and the test you need to contact Linda through the contact uh, information there 
and or take the test uh, or assessment just from the book itself. Um, Linda, it's been a pleasure having you on um, from now. Hopefully I don't mess this up. South Bend, Indiana or North Bend? <laughs> South, <you're> right. South, <laughs> so from South Bend, Indiana to you, uh, to very close to Notre Dame, which is very important for most of my listeners to know because uh, Notre Dame is a stone's throw from where she is, I'm sure. Um, is it? Yes? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, blessings to you. Thank you for being on Inside Personal Growth. Thanks for taking the time to impart your wisdom and the years that you've spent studying this and then applying it to um, major league players, major, minor league, it doesn't matter who they are, applying it out to people. Um, and I would just get from this conversation that, um, you know, based on the kind of players you've been working with and the kind of sometimes egos that are out there, that this material is just so valid for them. So thanks for bringing it to them so they can make adjustments, really, maybe not as much professionally, but personally, um, so they can have better coping skills. I love those guys. They're like my sons. So, oh, I'm um, sure they are. Yeah. Yeah. So anything we can do to help them succeed, that's that's what I want to do. So well, I appreciate good for, that. Good for you. Thank you for the work you're doing. And thanks Thank for you. being on the show. Thanks. Great to spend the time with you and have a great weekend.